California edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. I'm glad you're with us today. We are joined by Lois Capps. She's a member of the U.S. Congress. She's running for re-election. That election will be held on November 6th. And you are now home for summer recess. You'll go back. You'll come back here. And I know that you've been speaking a lot with constituents. You've been going to farmers markets, many of them on the Central Coast. What are they saying to you? Thank you, Brad. California Edition is an opportunity for me to speak on behalf of my constituents, yes. and they have a lot on their mind, as you might uh, guess, be mm -hmm. this being the August break that mm -hmm. we take from Congress, mm -hmm. and this particular one, as it leads up now to the 2012 election, is uh, full of uh, question marks and what are we doing and are we better off now than we were four years ago? Those kinds of things seep in. And that's an interesting question because it really depends how you frame it. I mean, some would say, well, we were so bad off four years ago that I guess, yes, we are better off, but we're not better off as much as we should be. Well, when you look back four years ago, we're clearly better off today. And when I visit a farmer's market, for example, to talk about uh, issues that relate to agriculture. You're here on the Central Coast. Right. Our, our background, our, our, our backyard really is, uh, are the farm fields, whether right. it's strawberries, cattle, avocados, wine. wine. Paso. Yes, we, we have an abundance of good uh, agriculture. But there, these folks are asking me when I go to the farmer's market, why haven't you passed the farm bill? Right. We have half the country burning up in a drought and we need the relief that the Farm Bill will bring. So I'm going back to Congress next week saying to my colleagues, come on, that's, that's the number one issue. And it gives me a chance to talk with them about a bill I just introduced, a very bipartisan Which bill. Which is? It's on organic labeling, making sure that we protect the organic farm business, which is big here in California, but really across the country. There are really no protections for the label so that you can make sure that when you buy a product that says organic, that it really is. My colleague from upstate New York, Richard Hanna, yes. a good Republican, <laughs> he and I agree. And that's, a, right. I want to bring that part in about the bipartisanship. But, well, are we seeing more of that, you know, as an outside observer in California looking into Washington, it seems like the environment is hyper-partisan, very charged, especially on the House side. Yes, it is. At the same time, we do work together, uh, colleagues across the aisle, in many ways. These are the stories and the partnerships that never get told. You know Daryl Issa, sure. Southern California colleague. He's very partisan, pr pretty, one could argue. Con pretty opposite from me right. and many of our votes. Fast and furious. We worked together on the transportation bill that talked about where we wanted to make sure that language was in it to make sure that we have evacuation routes mm. To, for our communities that can be isolated in the event of a disaster. A forest fire. We've seen what happened when we had a mudslide in La right. Conchita and Highway 101 was completely blocked off. So we want to make sure that it was a, we think about Now, this is not a partisan issue, right. is it? So One it's should a natural. Argue it shouldn't be. It's a natural. I know that you recently attended a health fair. I think it was in Santa Maria. Yes, is that it was. right? And health care had been on the minds of a lot of voters. It seems like since the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the Affordable Care Act, we're not hearing as much about it. But then again, what are your constituents saying? Well, we hear it in the headlines, and it'll be featured in the debates on sure. uh, repealing Obamacare. I mean, there have been charges made and uh, defenses made. Right. Uh, and I, I, I can tell you that when I visited the street fair in Santa Maria, where a lot of the farm workers live in a particular neighborhood, right. where there is a community clinic, people don't stop and think. Our community clinics all across the country have been strengthened and provided extra funds uh, for expansion of their hours or even in some case building new clinics so we can make health care more accessible. Uh, many, in many instances, uh, nobody can get to the doctor's office because their work hours, particularly in agriculture, right. Uh, make that impossible. And is that as a result of passage of the Affordable exactly. Care Act? Right. There's a provision in it. It doesn't get talked about very much. And I wanted to demonstrate uh, in the street fair with the farm workers that their health care access has been made more available through the law. So are your constituents saying defend Obamacare, repeal Obamacare, or is it just not in the conversation anymore? It doesn't come up as much, although mm. it will be coming up in probably in my very close uh, campaign right. election uh, because it's one of those debate uh, topics. But I want to just talk 
uh, about the number of young people who tell me thank you. I can stay on my parents' plan until I'm 26. And the parents who say, I was worried stick about my, my child graduating from college with no job prospect. And where was that, you know, where was health care going to come? And as I understand it, one of the more popular provisions, in addition to allowing children to stay on plans until they're 26, is the elimination of a pre existing condition oh, rejection. Absolutely. I work closely with many of the groups like di people with diabetes or juvenile arthritis, mm. uh, any a number of the chronic conditions that many children experience. And the, the Number one challenge is providing health insurance. That being said, I've spoken with many small business people and there's some nervousness about the Affordable Care Act. They don't necessarily understand what it means to their bottom line. And when I say small business, I can mean a business from one, a business to 50 to 100. I mean, you know, these are still considered small businesses right. even if you only employ only 25, 75 people. What can you tell us? Have you spoken with small business people about the Absolutely. Care Act? this morning? Uh -huh. We have As we meet, speak today. As right. we speak today, mm -hmm. I was with the Morro Bay mm -hmm. Chamber of Commerce, a city in San Luis Obispo County. A, absolutely, mm -hmm. little beach community, mm -hmm. and the question came up uh, a, a, in the conversation. I am an entrepreneur. It's only me and maybe my a family member and this health I can't find health insurance I can afford. And I said to this person, and a few others that chimed in and I asked what the size of their businesses were and they were they were all under 25 mm. and I said this law was designed for you folks because they don't have to provide a health insurance for their employees they can all go on the exchange as individuals and when, when the insurance companies are uh, until they become more competitive in their prices they can be subsidized to, to enter the, the market and what's interesting is there are 50 states in this union each state is supposed to set up exchanges and for those that are looking toward those exchanges California is right at the forefront. I'm so glad you mentioned yeah. that mm -hmm. and we can be thankful that our state has embraced, embraced health care reform. And it was a Republican governor Arnold Schwarzenegger of California who got the ball rolling on the exchanges. And that's an example of how bipartisan this law really is and let's see what California can show the rest of the country. One would hope there could be bipartisan agreement because in the end, I mean, the law is the law. The Supreme Absolutely. Court has upheld the law. I do want to also ask you about, we'll call them women's rights. I'm not sure what to call it, but we know that the issue of contraception, abortion rights has been injected into the campaign. Many are surprised by this. We thought we would be talking about the economy. What are your constituents saying about contraception, abortion rights? Well, this is so far from where my constituents are and where we really are mm -hmm. in California. We've settled these matters uh, long ago, and we're so concerned that we get our economy back on track. It's a big distraction, but it's also a signal uh, that uh, the social issues are really front and center on the other side. I want us to address how we get more small businesses functioning. We have exa great examples here on the Central Coast, as we do throughout the state of California, of entrepreneurs of that American spirit, right. and we need to assist them. Although, isn't it a distraction to your benefit? When you think about California, these issues have been resolved years ago, so couldn't one argue, you know, keep adding fuel to that fire because it gets people thinking. Well, this is the way I'm, this is one of the reasons I'm so frustrated in Congress. We have been spinning our wheels. Mm -hmm. There's been a huge effort in Congress to defund Obamacare, the uh, the energy policies, all of the efforts that were made in the previous Democratic-led mm -hmm. Congress. I, I call that, I mean, I could, I could kick back and say, let it play out. I want us to work. I, I want us to get the job done. Okay. There is too much at stake in terms of the future of our economy her and name, our young people. Her name is Lois Capp. She's a member of the U.S. Congress. My name is Brad Pomerantz. We'll be right back on California Edition.
Welcome back to California Edition. I'm Brad Palmer. It's our guest, Adam Hill. He's a member of the Board of Supervisors in San Luis Obispo County. He represents one of two nuclear power plants in the state of California, Diablo Canyon. Aren't you glad you don't represent San Onofre, yes. which is currently shut down for a variety of reasons. Right. Um, how is Diablo Canyon operating? I know that there may be additional pressure on it as a result of mm -hmm. San Onofre, but <clears throat> everything going smoothly at Diablo? Yeah, as far as we can tell, they you know they, they continue to do everything everything as, as they should and, and update us on any small problems. I mean, it's it's pretty well um, regulated in the day-to-day -day right. activities. You had some sea salps a few months ago that caused it to shut down for there, a day or so. Yeah, there are some there are some uh, weird uh, right. occasions when things, uh, you know, uh, cause problems in, in operations. But, um, you know, the San Onofre thing is, is, is really, it's, it's interesting partly because I think it's been offline a lot longer than anybody suspected well, I when mean, it first. Since I think it was January 31st. Yeah. And that puts a tremendous strain on the power grid. And yeah. there is some view it will never come back to full operational capacity. We're hearing some of that. I mean, they've started now to, to, to take uh, fuel out of, out, of, out of the reactors. Um, they've so laid people off. They've taken fuel out of the reactors. So, so those does are big that steps. present an opportunity for Diablo? Could it increase capacity, therefore hire some more folks? Wouldn't that be nice? I, you know, I, they, I don't think they could increase capacity in terms of the two reactors that they currently have. I mean, I, I, I guess uh, they could, uh, though I doubt they would right. apply for another reactor. They do have the ability to They have to, to get that. their approval for these two. Right. So I think they're pretty focused on everything that they're doing now, seismic testing to, uh, to relicensing. And, and let's talk about seismic okay. testing. There have been a few commission meetings by the State Lands Commission. Right. The most recent one was in August, mm -hmm. and it actually changed the way that the seismic testing will go on. I should back up, if I may, and first ask, right. why are we having seismic testing? Okay. There was a recent fault yeah, found. Yeah, right. Well, in 2008, they discovered a, a, another fault that runs about a mile parallel to the plant itself, the Shoreline Fault. Right. And that was just as I was coming into office, and I got a, oh, a pretty, pretty extensive <laughs> briefing from the uh, from the U.S. Geological Survey and 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 a, and a number of other people. And, 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 and at the time, it led to a lot of people believing that we needed more information. And, and what was scary is we knew there was the Hosgree fault, right. then they find the Shoreline fault, right. and then the Fukushima earthquake hits in 2011, I believe, right. which caused, I mean, there was a fear of a meltdown at the nuclear plant Fukushima, right. and so that just caused a lot of nervousness. Yeah. Well, I think what happened after the, this most recent fault was identified, uh, Sam Blakesley, who you know right. is our uh, state, state senator, senator and, and then was our assembly person, um, had sponsored some legislation to push for this kind of testing because it's not part of the NRC's review right. for relicensing. And we followed that up uh, not long afterwards by by passing our own letter at the Board of Supervisors asking the, that the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission delay relicensing and and uh, require this advanced seismic testing. And, and that has been agreed to by PG&E? Eventually. It took a while. It did. Uh, uh, at first, uh, NRC pretty much said no to us, and if, you know that's their right. right. They're, the, they're the authority over the plant. We're, we don't have really any authority. Right. Um, eventually, I think, as we worked with PG&E, and then I think in, in post-Fukushima, because of all the concerns, I think uh, there was a meeting of the minds that these were things that needed to be done, that the legislation had put it in place to be right. done, and it was better to I think it was better for everybody to look like they were and, and pursuant to that August meeting, some changes were made. The survey period's being shortened, mm -hmm. um, which throws it into now, instead of ha all happening in one period, or right. some will happen at the end of this year, some mm -hmm. will happen at the end of 2013. Right, right. Is, what do you make of that? I mean, could, shouldn't you just get it all done in one fail swoop? Well, the, you know, there's a lot of concerns, and one of the concerns that we're hearing, hearing much about now uh, are the concerns about the effect on marine life. Right. We want to see as minimal, oh, altogether, marine life and any, any environmental impact, we'd like to see that lessened, and, and, and we think um, that, that, should, that should adhere to, um, to you know, what goes on seasonally in the sea and also what else might be looked at in terms of the actual survey design itself rather than the concerns that PG&E may have about relicensing and the clock ticking it, on that. Is the belief that the marine life is I don't know, less sensitive or less present in November and December when the testing will occur. There, yeah, there's less. There's there's less migration. There's less. I mean, we we, we do suspect that they're, they're they're you know, and that's PG&E's role to work with the fisheries, the fisher industry, and, and such to make sure that um, that everybody's properly compensated on, on, and, on that level. And as I understand it, PG&E has agreed to set aside six million dollars 
for monitoring mitigation mm -hmm. measures right. uh, to avoid marine mammals to compensate fishermen who are right. going to lose business, I right. presume. Right. And has that been welcomed? Do, do the fishermen believe that's enough to compensate, or is that still up in the air? You know, I haven't been involved in negotiations, but I don't think the fishermen typically are happy. <laughs> and I, I, I don't blame them. I mean, right. this is a disruption, and in, in in, you know, typically our fishermen are, are multi generational. Yes. They, you know, the their Portuguese families, came. Uh, they've been, right. you know, a lot of folks have been fishing for quite a long time off our coast. And, and this is uh, this is something that that's very upsetting to them, and we understand that. Here's another interesting development. Uh, it's I've said this to you before. It is incredibly ironic that Sam Blakesley, state senator, is a geologist. Mm -hmm. He represents this area. Bruce Gibson, a supervisor, is a geologist. Right. He represents this area. Right. What are the chances? But um, Bruce Gibson, your colleague on the board, has been appointed to a position to oversee part of the study. Why don't you explain right. that? Yeah, he's on the peer review panel basically representing the citizens of San Luis Obispo mm -hmm. County. And that was something that we pushed for early on too and we were happy that PG&E decided that that was something that should happen and then that we should be able to choose our own person. And we thought just for the sake of reporting to my colleagues and such, it was easy and Bruce wanted to do it and he's right. in Sacramento right now on, right. On, on, on these sort of tasks. But the State Lands Commission also authorized on the augmentation of the peer review panel. Why don't you explain that? Well, they, you know, the, there's ability for uh, for us to, you know, Bruce is, is able to uh, consult with outside experts. Mm. Uh, other members of the peer review panel can do that as well. They want to make sure that um, what all the data that's derived from from these tests. And you know we don't think that these tests are going to be done again anytime soon after sure. they're done. That this provides us with uh, the kind of data, the, the the data that we need, and the data that can be analyzed, so that anything that needs to be addressed out at the plant um, can can be. And, and let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we keep talking about testing, right. but results are going to come in. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the range of possibility? I mean, could it tell us that you got to shut this thing down immediately? There could be a major shaker any moment. You know, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I, I because right. I'm not a geologist. Yeah, we can ask Bruce Gibson. <laughs> yeah, well, that, I mean, obviously, I guess the range would be from that to um, to to figure out ways to uh, shore up any infrastructure issues or safety issues. It could be a, it could be anything from small adjustments to something rather rather uh, big. It's now, hard to it's hard to now, anticipate. PG&E recently went through let's call it a PR crisis mm -hmm. as a result of a gas explosion mm -hmm. in San Bruno outside of San Francisco. Right. And some have argued, you don't need to say this, right. that maybe they didn't deal with that situation as well as they should have. They've been trying mm -hmm. to kind of circle and, and make it right. Uh, are the residents of San Luis Obispo behind PG&E in light of the San Bruno fiasco? I mean, you yeah. know, they're, they're, I wonder if there's some cynicism. Well, I think that there there probably is, but generally speaking, uh, uh, you know, and, and I'm sure they would be the first to tell you, but right. the um, the plant, the the company is very popular in our area because it's the largest private employer. Isn't it the largest employer? Period. Um, it can be depending right. on what they might be doing at any time. Fair if, if if they have certain outages and right. maintenance, and they can be employing another right. thousand people, um, but they're definitely the largest private employer. They are really the anchor company in many ways because they're the only major corporate company located here. Right, um, and they're the big biggest taxpayer for the county. They provide a lot of money that goes to the school system, San Luis Coastal, mm -hmm. um, critical critical to that. Property They're, taxes. The, property taxes. They give a lot of money to nonprofits. And so I think if if you were if we were doing our own poll, you would probably find that they still are very popular among the citizens, partly because you're not very far away from somebody who either works at the plant or somebody who knows somebody that works at the plant. So and are you confident that with the changes made through the State Lands Commission in their August meeting that the seismic testing will be done in a way that balances the interests of all parties? We feel much better. We feel good about the, the independent review of the survey design itself. Um, that was one point that, that, that Bruce had um, a, a conflict with PG&E about and, uh, and, and, and we're satisfied okay. with, the, with the decision, so we, we hope it'll, it'll be productive. His name is Adam Hill. He's a member of the Board of Supervisors in San Luis Obispo County representing Diablo Canyon. My name is Brad Palmer. We'll be right back on California.
Welcome back to California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Glad you're still with us. Our guest is Debbie Peterson. She's a member of the Grover Beach City Council. She is running for mayor. That election will be held on November 6th. How's the race going? It's going very well. It's all heated up and it's uh, we're all ready to go. In fact, I got up at 4.30 to put signs out this I morning. I was going to say. <laughs> now, it's interesting. In addition to your mayoral race, there are races for city council but also a race to turn Grover Beach from a general law city into a charter city. What does that mean? Well, effectively, charter cities have their own, uh, their own document, their own, own charter, their own, own constitution. Own, own constitution, yep. And give us some background because it's very interesting when you explained mm -hmm. to me that Grover Beach had been a charter city and yes. then something happened. Give, tell us, give us a sense of that. Well, I, we were established in 1959, I believe, with a charter. Right. And then sometime in the 70s, one of the, uh, not sure why, at the instigation of a mayor, I've heard, they changed it back or they changed it to a general law right. city. And um, that 40 years ago, and now we're moving into being a charter city again because we feel like we're the best people to make decisions about how our city should be yeah, run. And let's discuss yeah. that because mm -hmm. people may not realize the distinctions between right. general law and right. charter. Explain the distinction. Well, with a charter city, it's custom tailored. So the city chooses which of the state's um, state's general laws, laws right. that they want to work under. Nothing changes. We're not, not our, all of our laws don't change, but our, in our constitution, we have a choice. So we can, it's custom made for us. Uh, with a general law city, the state has a basic constitution. It's a one size fits all. So 75% of our cities in the state are general law cities. And I understand I was speaking actually with a member of the San Luis Obispo City Council and under general law cities, um, salaries are set for city council members. And so arguably, there could be some changes. I mean, I, I'm not saying that yes. you're going there, but, yes. but, but that's an example mm -hmm. of the discretion right. that you will have. Right. Now, it's not as if you, if you do adopt a charter, you would be chucking all of the state laws. You can pick and choose. Yes, and we're maintaining most of the state laws. As far as council member salaries, that doesn't change. We are keeping in the, in the charter the, uh, that, the same as we had under general law. So we cannot increase our salaries. And in fact, and we could only change that if we go to a vote of the people. The there charter cannot it. be changed. However, and we're actually tightening up some of the rules. We're saying that under no circumstances can council members receive a pension or unemployment insurance. Why? So, Why not? Well, because I, I think we don't want to go the way Bell went. And we want I to understand. make sure that our, that our city feels confident that but they're not going to be taken. Here's what's interesting. Mm -hmm. I know it's in vogue to limit the benefits and the mm -hmm. salaries of politicians. Mm -hmm. But look, I mean, you're a busy woman. Mm -hmm. You run a real estate firm. Mm -hmm. um, why shouldn't you at least get a small pension for the work that you do for your city? Well, and in some cities, they do get small pensions. And I think Grover Beach is the poorest city of all the incorporated cities in our county, and the money's not there, and so we're not going to take it. But could you, in the future, allow yourselves to? I don't know. I mm -hmm. just look. I, I've said this before. <laughs> I'm not one who bashes politicians mm -hmm. as politicians. Mm -hmm. I believe politicians are people who work hard, who, as a general proposition, have whether you're Democrat or Republican, the right motives and instincts and. You know, you get what you pay for. And that has been my experience on the council and locally. Right. And most people, in fact, I haven't come across any local politicians who I would say don't genuinely have the best for their cities or their counties right. at heart. That so, be, okay, mm -hmm. so yeah. we'll move on. I digress. I agree with you. Yes. I think, you know, our we've been paid $300 a month since 1986. That has not gone What up. happened to inflation? I, I mean, know. <laughs> You know, I, yeah. I, I just yeah. feel as if you get what you pay for, and I know these yes. are very difficult fiscal times. Mm -hmm. So maybe now is not the time to give a raise mm -hmm. to council members mm -hmm. or create pensions, but be at that some as point, be. possibly it oh. would be a good thing to think about. Let's talk about your union partners because that has mm -hmm. often been a source of contention between municipalities. Mm -hmm. We know San Bernardino, we know Stockton, they have gone bankrupt and their city councils, their mayors have said, and 
at least some part because of ex uh, union extraction. So they were able to get uh, better benefits than the cities could handle. I understand that your union partners are nervous about turning the city into a charter city. Explain what the, the point of contention is. I think that most, my understanding is that our actual union partners, the, the unions of the staff, are in favor of it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and they're in favor of it because it, it will save money for the city on a number of levels. Um, so the, the place that it comes in that other unions from outside are coming in from all over California and are upset about it is because we're hoping that the 21% of our, pro of our um, projects that are not that are local projects with local dollars we would like to give our contractors the option of not using prevailing wage right now if you're a general law city the state dictates every single project must be prevailing wage so we must take the lowest bid we must um, uh, we must use prevailing wage and that has huge implications in terms of bookkeeping for both the contractors and us so we our understanding is Solvang's telling us that they've saved and other charter cities are saving between 8 and 15 percent by giving their contractors the option. So we'd like to have the well, option. What about the workers? Mm -hmm. I mean, shouldn't the workers mm -hmm. be paid? They should be paid and we're not saying we don't pay workers. Right. We're not but suggesting that our workers take the same salary that our that our city council members do. <laughs> Fair enough, but uh, touche. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. we are suggesting that they uh, we would like them to be paid market rates. And, um, and we're only talking about a small segment of projects. We're talking about local projects with local dollars. Mm -hmm. So where we're using sales tax raised in Grover Beach, where we're using property taxes raised in Grover Beach, where we're doing local projects, we also want the option to say we will only hire local employees. We want to be able to dictate that. Now, the difference mm -hmm. between a general law city, a charter city, it can be a bit esoteric. Mm -hmm. And so as you are walking the streets in your run for mayor, I presume the issue of the status of the city is discussed. Sure. Is there a sense amongst constituents about, you know, the presumed importance of this ballot measure? Once people know about it, they're for it. And it has passed overwhelmingly in most of the cities that have, have put a measure on oh, the ballot. And because if people know what it is, they pass it. Ours is very simple. It's four pages, and it is on the city's website. Most people can digest four pages. I would hope. And there are only a few changes, and it's it shows what's not changed as well. Now, in addition to the charter amendment, mm -hmm. you are running for mayor, as I mentioned. Yes. And I do want to get a sense from you. What are voters asking you? What are they saying to you? What are the key mm -hmm. points of discussion? Well, you know, it's very interesting. Things have changed. It used to be streets, 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 streets. And now people actually say it with a smile on their face because they know there's no money. Our general fund is $6.9 million. It would cost us 36 to $44 million to get our streets up to scratch. And I'm sure mm -hmm. that your general fund is uh, uh, crying a tear given it lost a million dollars as a result of redevelopment a year. being eliminated. Mm -hmm. A million dollars a year. So yeah. if it's not streets, what is it? What are they asking of you? Well, what, what we're finding about the streets is they're saying, and I've had five people say this to me and no one say opposite, that maybe it is time to raise a bond. Maybe we're so sick of it that we're willing to pay a little money to do it. Um, the that magic, says a yeah, lot. yeah, that and says I've been really surprised lot. because people have initiated that conversation with me. I have not initiated it with them. So, is that um, something you'll look at if you are successful in November, floating a bond? Yes, and that's something again we'll put to the vote. Right, you have to. Yeah, yes. Now the challenge with any bond, though. Mm -hmm. I think school bonds are different, but mm -hmm. you, I think you would need two-thirds, is that accurate? For any kind of a new tax, we need two-thirds, and right. there, are, there are different ways that we can right. do it, so but it I think it's probably two-thirds. And my guess is that two-thirds of our people would like our streets fixed. Which would be <laughs> quite a statement. It's interesting. Yeah. I know in November 2010, I think it was 50, uh, 40 mm -hmm. out of 53 local bond sales tax mm -hmm. measures passed, wow. many of them needing two-thirds. Mm -hmm. So given the right climate and the right, right discussion, uh, it should be interesting to see what happens with Prop 30, the governor's tax initiative, which is going to be on the ballot this fall, increasing yes. sales tax, yes. et cetera. Okay, Debbie Peterson, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Thank Her you. name is Debbie, Debbie Peterson. She is a member of the Grover Beach City Council. She is running for mayor. The election is on November 6th. I'm Brad Palmer. Thank you so much for watching California Edition.